Welcome back to Turning Hard Times and Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have Keith Weiner with me once again. Uh, Dr. Weiner is the CEO and founder of Monetary Metals. He is a leading authority in the areas of gold, money, and credit, and has made important contributions to the development of trading techniques found upon the analysis of bid-ask spreads. Uh, Keith, uh, is, uh, he's been on the show before, uh, and I want him to address... Um, well, he has actually, through monetary metals, addressed one of the issues, one of the reasons people say, yeah, don't bother with gold or silver because you can't get any return on it. Well, uh, monetary metals has definitely proven that that's not true, uh, and I can attest personally, as a very small investor, uh, I am getting uh, 2 or 3%, something in that range, on a lease, uh, some gold that I've leased through monetary metals. Uh, and so uh, you can just put that one to rest, that whole, that whole excuse for not owning gold, that you can't get any uh, returns on it because you can quite clearly. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Keith. Thanks for having me, Jay. It's, uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, we titled our show, Why Invest in Gold if the Dollar is Strong? And I know, uh, I believe that's your position. Uh, you do believe that for reasons that I want you to explain in a few minutes, why you're you're really bullish on the dollar, and I certainly believe you're right about that. Uh, but, you know, most people think you, you own gold and silver to protect yourself against inflation. But uh, anyway, before we get to that, uh, just so people can understand a little bit more about monetary metals and the products that you provide, uh, maybe first of all, why would somebody, why would a company, because you're, you're lending or leasing gold to companies, why, what's in the best interest of companies um, – to, to borrow or to, or to lease gold from uh, through monetary metals? Why would they do that? Well, that's a good question. So the first thing is they have a need for finance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if this was an inventory of wood or copper or bricks, you know, the prices of those things are so much lower that maybe you just write a check out of petty cash uh -huh. or the inventory you need. But gold is obviously $1,800 an ounce. Mm -hmm. And um, that has to be financed somehow. So your choice is equity capital. You sell shares. But equity capital is very expensive. If you believe in the growth and the future of your business, why would you want to dilute your ownership for relatively low productivity investments such as inventory? Um, you can borrow. The most typical uh, solution is borrow dollars. So it looks like this. You borrow a um, uh, million dollars. You buy a million dollars worth of gold. That's great. Um, the thesis is that gold goes you know, up over time or the dollar goes down over time. So you should do well in that trade, which is essentially short dollars, long gold. Mm -hmm. But what if the price of gold drops 10% in the meantime? Mm -hmm. What if there is a drawdown on this trade? Mm -hmm. And of course, that can happen. And if it does, then if it's a big enough drawdown, maybe 10% is big enough, maybe it isn't, maybe 15%, you are insolvent. Mm -hmm. so the value of your asset has just gone down to um, you know, nine hundred thousand dollars or eight hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, but the liability is still a million. Mm -hmm. Now, if you lease the gold, you eliminate that need or that that risk, uh, that price risk, uh, which would normally be a need for hedging. So mm -hmm. normally, you borrow dollars, you buy the inventory, and then you put on hedge, um, which just creates more complexity, moving parts, mm -hmm. costs, you know, so forth. And um, so the lease is simply a more user friendly. Um, you know, easier to use product and um, and, and therefore lower cost. Mm -hmm. All right. And then from the investor's perspective, uh, what are the risks and rewards? I mean, what I guess risks, uh, if you could address risks, I believe you're, uh, the lease that I have, for example, I think it's somewhere in between 2 and 3%. I'm not exactly sure. It's something like that. Um, you know, I mean, interest rates have gone up a lot, but they're on dollars. They're not on gold. Uh, what, uh, what is, can you just maybe highlight the risk reward? Why would, why does it make sense for someone like me to, uh, to buy, you know, to, to put some gold in there and get two or 3%, I get paid back in gold as well. Right. I was going to say, um, you know, yeah, our lease rates tend to vary between two and 3%. We have a few outliers, but that tends to be the, the range. Of course you could sell your gold and buy dollars. Yeah. And you could go into short term T-bills at uh, 4%. But then you've got dollars with all the risks yeah. and, uh, of, of loss associated. What is the dollar going to be worth in a few years? Well, that's a big, giant question mark. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in a lease, 
that is not a loan to the lessee. That is not on their balance sheet. It does not become their asset. If they declare bankruptcy, it is not available to their creditors. Um, however, you know, there's no such thing as a return without some kind of risk. Anybody promising you a, a risk-free return, uh, you should run away from because that's not uh, that's not legitimate. Um, the lease is the lowest risk thing that we can think of that still pays a return. Obviously, you can hold the metal on your mattress, which is no risk in, uh, and no no return, at least in gold terms. The price of gold may go up and down, but in gold terms, uh, there's no return there. And the lease is, is paying something because it's financing inventory. So what are the risks? Well, the risk is that the lessee could either by mistake or by fraud, um, you know, ship it out somewhere uh, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, sell it, uh, you know, uh, when the, what you're not supposed to do. Um, so we put all kinds of, uh, you know, things around this, obviously contractual clauses that don't allow them to sell it. Mm -hmm. Their internal controls and make sure that, you know, you, you can't lease gold to a little mom and pop jewelry store because if they're if they're failing, what's going to happen is they're going to sell everything that isn't nailed down. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, you and the landlord show up when everything's all defaulted and then you see little holes in the carpet where the, you know, where the wires are sticking out and even yeah. where the cases have been, you know, stolen or sold or whatever. Um, so it has to be a more substantial company that has internal controls and, you know, process and, um, you know, a, a real inventory tracking system, an ERP system, and, you know, reporting and a bunch of other things we do. And there's insurance that the lessee has. We have an, another layer of insurance at our level. There's a lot that we do to, um, and obviously we get to know who the people are. Do they have any kind of credit problems? Do they have any criminal backgrounds? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there is a non-zero risk. Um, what I can say is in uh, going on 50 leases right now, um, so far, not a single gram uh, has been lost. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully that, that risk is uh, a lot lower than, uh, than, than just that, but that's our experience so far. Yeah, well, we do know that long term the dollar loses value. And I, I believe in spite of the fact that you are uh, – bullish on the dollar, you also recognize the fact that gold has risen vis-a-vis -vis the dollar over the long term, right? Yep, absolutely. And that's why long term you want to own uh, you, you want to own precious metals. I, I want to store my wealth in precious metals primarily and real estate, maybe the things that I need to have to live, to live with. But um, make the case for the your bullishness on the dollar and it has to do with the united states unique position as the world's reserve currency as i understand it the senior currency if you will globally is that do i have that right yeah i mean a lot of people say it's the least dirty shirt i would actually go farther to say or the cleanest dirty shirt i would go so far as to say it's the least dirty meaning they're all dirty and uh you know this, the dollar may be a bit less dirty but but it, it goes deeper than that all the other currencies are dollar derivatives and, um, you know, just a really important statement, I think, doesn't get enough, you know, focus and emphasis. All the other currencies derive their value and their very existence from the dollar itself. Of course, the dollar is on both sides of every major balance sheet in the world, unlike any other currency. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, this, this is really important because at a time of credit contraction, mm -hmm. and that is the world that we're in right now yeah, and likely to remain in. You know, credit withdraws from the periphery inward towards the core. The dollar is the core. At some point, why would you want to own a derivative when you when you're desperate desperately in need of of owning the uh, you know the underlying uh, you know instrument itself? People, a lot of people try to think of this as you know putting the putting assuming that everybody in the world is in the same boat as themselves, which is not really a balance sheet, but essentially some assets. And you're trying to figure out, do I put my assets in gold? Do I put my assets in dollars? Do I put my assets in Swiss francs or real estate or whatever? But that isn't really how the major balance sheets of the world operate. They're leveraged. They have, you know, again, dollars on both sides of the balance sheet. And a lot of their behaviors are forced. When, when credit is contracting, what that means is it becomes harder and harder for them to obtain the dollar financing they need. Mm -hmm. now, the way the world is structured, the, certainly the major banks and other financial institutions 
have borrowed short or short term to to buy long term assets. Mm-hmm. So imagine um, financing a house by going to the bank and getting an overnight loan, which would be the most extreme case of that. And every day you have to go back to the bank when when your loan is due and beg for you know another another twenty four hours. And you have to do that 365 days a year times 30 years. Um, so when when all of a sudden credit conditions change, the bank's like, nah, nah we're, we're, we're good, bro. We just want the money back. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, no, no, but, but I've got this house and I can't, you know, the bank's like, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Sell the house, do whatever you got to do. And so you and everyone else is in that same boat of suddenly trying to dump houses. Uh, and I'm not making an argument about real estate per se. I want to be clear. I'm just using this as a uh, illustration of this problem of borrowing short and lending long, but these are these are balance sheets that are forced to be desperately clawing every dollar they can out of the market, mm-hmm. and um, you know not so much euros and and pounds sterling and yen and yuan dollars specifically, and when that happens, you know, uh, so people say the dollar is going up. I, I, I kind of have to chuckle at this, and I say, you know, the one thing that nobody wants to measure the dollar in terms of is gold. Yes. I would to say the dollar is 17 milligrams of gold, down from 1,505 milligrams, uh, you know, before all this insanity started in 1913. They want to say, no, no, measure the dollar in terms of consumer prices, measure the dollar in terms of dollar derivatives, the dollar index, which is largely the euro. Um, but I would say, no, flip it the other way. Right. So how, how did you be a, a, both a gold bull in dollar terms and a dollar bull in euro terms? It becomes easier to see when you flip it the other way. Yeah. That what you're saying is the dollar derivative currencies are, are likely to continue falling and the do- at the same time against the dollar, which is the only way they can be measured. And yes. at the same time, the dollar is likely to continue to fall against gold, which mm-hmm. is the right way the dollar should be measured. Mm-hmm. That makes yeah. sense. So picture like you have a lighthouse, um, which is actually attached to the rock, you know, the bedrock of, of the mainland. The lighthouse is the gold. It isn't going anywhere. Then you have a, a ship which is slowly, you know, leaking, and there's also a giant storm and it's tossing it around in the waves. That's the dollar. And then you have various life rafts and dinghies and people man overboard with, you know, they're throwing them the little uh, donut thing on the rope, and they're going up and down relative to the boat, which is going up and down relative to the lighthouse. Mm-hmm. They're, you know, the people on the boat are looking at the lighthouse saying, why is the lighthouse going up and down? <laughs> yeah. and, the people, and the people in the half sinking dinghies are saying, why is the boat going up and down? Yeah. yeah. Um, and meanwhile, it's, it's a vantage point problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So in other words, think in terms of gold, measure things in terms of real money, um, you know, time honored mon- money um, demanded that is market demanded money, gold. Um, well, well, you know, this, so we're, we continue, though, on this path um, of issuing more and more debt, the United States going into debt. And it's sort of it's sort of it's sort of a paradox. And I mean, the more the more debt we go into, the stronger the dollar gets. It's opposite of what most gold bugs have always thought that we would have, you know, the more money we print, that that's just going to cause the dollar to to go to the dustbin of history. And we would have you know, gold prices that would go to the moon. And it just hasn't worked that way, has it? it would just, just think of it this way. Suppose you own a little store, I don't know, a print shop, and you own it free and clear. You don't owe any money personally. You don't owe any money in the business. Uh-huh. And, you know, the business produces some, you know, revenue, which you take home. You know, how much how much cash buffer do you need to hold? You know, I mean, whatever, a couple of weeks of payroll, a month worth of payroll maybe. Mm-hmm. And, and that's it. And everything else you can put into other forms of savings or other assets or, you know, as you say, real money, gold. But imagine now that same business producing that same revenue and you have like $8 million of debt loaded on the business. And personally, you know, your your house is, is mortgaged up to the hilt. You have two cars that you bought on credit, you have credit cards and student loans and all the rest of the stuff. Well, how much cash do you need as a buffer against the slightest down tech in the market? A lot. Yeah. You know, probably six to 12 months. Yeah. Uh, just because of your own debt load. So the perversity is uh, the deeper everyone goes into debt, and it isn't just governments. Yeah. It's every business, it's every corporation, it's every student, it's every you know everyone who drives a car. The deeper everyone goes into debt, the more that they desperately, urgently need dollars. more dollars. First of all, it yeah. serves the debts, and then secondly, they have to constantly be increasing their buffer against 
you know, a turn in the market where suddenly you can't make the revenues anymore. You know, you don't want the banks to foreclose on your business and your house and your car. So um, that's well, the, Keith, of it. the greater the debt, the greater the demand for dollars. Yeah, Keith, uh, my, my engineer is saying we only have two minutes and I wanted to ask you about Triffin's paradox. Uh, this is a quote that I just picked up from someone. Uh, it says, uh, Triffin's paradox, which notes that to own the world's reserve currency, you have to constantly run persistent trade deficits in order to ensure global liquidity in your currency. But at some point, the growing divergency between debt and the ability to pay for it, GDP is unsustainable. Do you do you agree with that? That there has to be an end to this thing? Oh, a absolutely, one hundred percent. I think Triffin was ahead of his time. He was absolutely prescient as uh, as an oracle in his his insights and his observations. Okay, and how does this thing end in thirty seconds? At some point, you can't service the debts. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I've written about what I call the heat death of the economic universe, which is more and more debt, but the, each dollar of debt is adding less and less GDP. Exactly. exactly. Marginal productivity of debt is falling. And then, yeah, you get to the point where it's no longer sustainable. Well, what cannot so be, then, will not be. So then you have a reset of some kind. And that is, do you expect that anytime soon? I, it's, it's not tomorrow and it's not next year. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would use the word 476 AD, not reset, but to be really clear that there's not there's no bouncing back from it. I mean, it's a death of civilization kind of event, oh not a, uh, you know, wipe out the money like a neutron bomb. And then we issue some new money and, you know, life goes on and the Starbucks lattes. For everybody. You don't see that. You don't see that no. happen. Oh. No, it's, it's, a, it's a consumption of capital when you run out of capital, civilization collapses. Keith, Keith we're going to have to have you back because there's too much. There's so much here that I want to get into and, and understand more about. Thank you so much. We're just out of time. i got to go now. But thank Glad you so much. Back. Thank you so much, Keith, for, for being with us, and uh, we'll look to do it again sometime.